Good morning, good morning. Welcome, family, to the house of the Lord. It's good to have you here today. Oh, what a beautiful day that God has blessed us with. And we're so glad that you're here as we worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Thank you, Lord. All right. I'm not going to pick on you like that Rouse guy does, okay? If, if you're sick, stay home. He, he will know if I don't say that. Okay, he's out, he's out playing in the desert uh, this weekend. But uh, thank you. I know that we're all still trying to pay attention to our, make sure our health is okay when we're gathered together. Um, but we're also concerned about that spiritual health. So we got to get together. We've got to spend time before the Lord and our, making sure our hearts are knit together for his purpose and all that we do. Uh, check it out back here. There's some sushi and some yogurt, a little bit of bread. Uh, but make sure it all goes away. Um, I, I, uh, or else uh, Jack has to eat sushi all week. Um, okay, ministry council. There's a ministry council meeting uh, this afternoon right after worship. And if, if you'd like to see what's going on uh, and see the different things we're praying for and concerned about uh, as a family, uh, everybody's welcome to be a part of that. And that'll be uh, right after worship service for about four, uh, half hour to 45 minutes. So we do that. Disciples, discipleship class today at 5. And we're discussing, we're going through how to share your faith. So if you want to be a part of that, um, and so that we can share as we share our faith in Christ and share what, uh, what God's purpose and plan is for, for people, uh, that's what that's about. So it's a good, we're having a good time of fellowship there. On, is it, let's see, March 4th, Kit Carson. It's the um, Alternative Medical Clinic's annual walk and 5K run. Anybody going to do the 5K run? Okay, not me either. Um, but if you'd like to participate as a walker or a runner, please pick up your flyer in the foyer. Um, every participant must register, um, so that we just need to know who's there. And if you raise $400, you get a free t-shirt. Um, Pat is definitely walking, and she says she gets really lonely if there's nobody there to walk with her. Uh, so she would love to have, uh, to have other walkers with her as well. Um, but to, to join in, and yes, you can donate throughout the year to Alternatives Medical Clinic, and they're doing a wonderful work in, in loving uh, and loving ladies um, and loving babies, and they're doing a wonderful job. Um, so be praying for them because they're always under attack too. It's a crazy world that we live in. But we serve a God who loves us and who values people and who values babies and who values life. Our God's about life, isn't he? What was the thing that was said to Mary as she's, they're running through the, they're running through the, uh, the, uh, the, the graveyard and the angel says, why are you seeking the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. God is so big on life. And uh, he's gone to prepare a place for us. And we're going to worship our gracious Lord in this day in all that we do. Revelation 5.13 says, And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all the things in them, I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever as we lift up our hands and our hearts to the King of Kings. As we lift up our hands, will you meet us here? Oh, 
it really helps if I sing the same song Paco's playing. Here we go.
will bow. Blessing and honor, glory and power, great, great lyrics, the ancient of days, he who was, who is, and who is to come. God wants us to worship him. He doesn't need us, for he couldn't be a self-sufficient God and need anything or anybody, but he wants us. And when Adam sinned, it was not he who cried, God, where art thou? It was God who cried, Adam. Jesus, friend of sinners, love me ere I go. Thank you, Lord. Oh. 
he paid for us uh, on that cross. Paul said, my glory is in the cross. It's not in my works or anything I've done. It's all in what you've done for us, Lord, in this day and in every day. Not just once in a while. Or not just when we get, uh, when, we're, when we're coming to the reality that we need you and we trust in you, but that trust goes on, Father, and grows in every single day. And may it be increased in our hearts, our faith increase and, and grow. We know that that's, that growth isn't going to take place without a little bit of struggle, Lord. But help us to keep our eyes fixed on you. You are our hope. There is no other hope. Help us to seek you, to love you with all our hearts, so that we can genuinely love people, so that we can be genuine and authentic as your children in all that we do. Lord, bless those that are here this day. God, thank you for the family here. Help us to love each other the way we should. You speak through us, Lord, to be encouragement and to edify and to build each other up. Help us to rejoice in the relationship that is ours as children of God. Lord, you're so gracious. May you be honored in all that's done today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Steve and Paco. Uh, you just solved the mystery. We thought we were missing our microphone. And there it was. Steve was hiding it up here. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> it was on the piano. Oh. Well, good morning again and welcome. Um, today, uh, well, go ahead and turn to Matthew 22. Remembering, I think just about everybody that's here today was here last week, but I see, I see four or five maybe that weren't maybe here last week. Welcome. Um, but uh, my key verse last week, when I say key verse, is one that kind of guides what we're reading about in today's message, again, Matthew 22. But 2 Corinthians 5.21, it's the last verse of, cha of uh, chapter 5 in 2 Corinthians. God made him, God the Father made him, Christ the Son, who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That is, that, that with Jesus' is righteousness, that's how we are able to be reconciled to God. It's only, his, only by His righteousness. And today, that really comes home, so to speak, in uh, the parable that we're going to continue with. So in Matthew chapter 22... Beginning in verse 1, we're just re we're going to read the whole parable. Remember, this is the one parable that kind of has two sub-parables. Uh, uh, when I finish it, reading all of it, uh, we'll talk about a little bit of overview, just a little bit more of overview, and then we're going to focus on the last four verses, the wedding garment problem. Jesus spoke to them again by parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding. But they would not come. That's the first invitation. Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my supper. My oxen and fattened calves are killed, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his business. The rest took his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. When the king heard about it, he was angry. He sent in his army and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. And he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the streets and invite to the wedding banquet as many as you find. So those servants went out into the streets and gathered together as many as they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. And so ends the first 
of the two parables that are together as one. This is how that ends. Is that it was still filled with guests, but not those who were originally invited. Verse 11. Well, let me back up. Is, let's, let's go over. Is it just about everybody who reads this parable, who knows God's word, is they're going to say, well, the king represents God the Father. The son represents Christ, God the Son. And he's invited his, his, his people, those that he would no, normally have the similar social circles with, uh, is this, the king is, is, is inviting, say, the nobleman, the, the princes, the, the well-to-do people to his son's wedding. And none of them came. They all refused, ignored, refused, or even treated his servants badly or even killed them, the ones who were going out delivering the invitations. And, and so he is, and those, those people represent, remember Jesus something I've got to remind you, is that Jesus is saying this, close to his crucifixion. So he's looking religious leaders in the eyes and telling them, doing a rearranged version of, the, of a similar parable that he's told before, but he's making it this time about the king, his noblemen, their refusal, and then that he's going to come and he's going to send his army and kill them, and then he's going to invite other people. And so all this is going on. The, so the, the people the, the, that refused, that even killed some of those who were doing the invitations, those are the, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people who killed the prophets. Right? Jesus stood before them there, that one Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would have gathered you together, right as a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. And then today was the day of your visitation. And, then at some point in A.D. 70, Titus, the Roman general, the future emperor of the Romans, is going to come and he's going to attack, besiege, and destroy the city of Jerusalem. And a, a whole lot of Hebrews are going to be massacred. Was, this is this story is being told in about A.D. 30. All right, so. And so it goes out. The second trip out is to invite those who weren't invited originally, as in throwing it open, say, to the Gentiles, or people that, that they wouldn't have expected. Yeah, the king is going to have new, new subjects and new friends. Verse 11, here we go in the second part. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man, a single man, he saw a man who was not wearing wedding garments. He said to him, friend, how did you get in here without wedding garments? And he, that is the man, was speechless. He had no excuse. He had nothing to say. Verse 13. Then the king told the attendants, bind him hand and foot, take him away, cast him into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then, for many are called, but few are chosen. Let me pray one more time. Father, uh, uh, give us uh, understanding. Or some of us, uh, we may never have heard this before. Some of us, uh, hard to, for us to wrap around, uh, get our mind wrapped around that, uh, that you're serious about your invitations and that there will be consequences for those who, who ignore you or refuse or reject you. And so, Father, we want to be uh, your willing subjects. We want to be, <clears throat> we want to live for you. So, Heavenly Father, give us your insight. Help us give us understanding that we might uh, apply this to our lives and us to your glory and your service. Father, if there is someone here who knows you not this day, Lord, could, would today, would you make today the day? And Father, for some of us, for many of us, Lord, is that there is a next step of obedience, a next step of faith in our journey. Lord, that the day be the day. Whatever that might be, Father. Uh, whether it's more time in your word, or, uh, focus, more focus to sharing the gospel with others, uh, getting equipped to do that, uh, uh, it, exercising uh, the, the spiritual gifts that you've given us. Whatever, whatever those things may be, Father, the next step. Lord, may we not uh, 
go back. Just like you tell us in your word, the one, the, the one who holds back, it says, my soul will have no pleasure in it. We want to make it be pleasing in your sight, Father. We pray. We pray it all. In Jesus' name, amen. And so we have here in verse 11, when the king came in to see the guests. Now this is this new group of people, right? This is the people that were invited after he dealt with the rebellious people. He saw a man who was not wearing wedding garments. Now, something that's necessary for us to realize, if we've never heard, if we don't know these customs, is... When you go to weddings in California, a lot of times, anybody here wear the best clothes you have when you go to a wedding in California? One, one weirdo. <laughs> Bless your heart, Miss Nina. Miss Nina says she wears nice clothes to weddings. The rest of us were a bunch of bums. What do we do? It's, I actually put on a suit when, uh, when uh, we did the uh, officiating for, when I did the officiating for uh, Cameo and Armand here in December, uh, and for the first time in my life, I forgot to say, you may kiss your bride. And so, while I'm introducing them, uh, Armand very politely says, what was it you said, Armand? Can I, can I kiss my bride now, or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> and the place erupted, and I probably laughed the loudest, and I already know that I'm a knucklehead, but I... That's one of those moments where I really do need to go get some cognitive testing. But we just go with what we got on. Or we, we put something nice and clean and ironed, but we don't necessarily go out and rent a tuxedo and wear our black suit or our very absolute best. We go to a wedding in California, do we? A lot of times we go in the summertime and people are sweating like hogs, right? You know that hogs don't sweat. They only sweat right out their snout. I had to get on hogs. Um, but back then, when, Je when, when Jesus is telling his story, is a well-to-do, a wealthy uh, father of the, probably the wealthiest. I'm not sure whether it was the brides or the son, but I think it was the, the, the father of the, of, the, of, the, of the groom, would, would have made white or very light-colored, full-length, uh, robes or mantles for people to wear to the wedding, and when they would say some of, some of them, they, they apparently they would they would hand out uh, the right size because you got to get your size relatively close here, right? It's not like you got to fix an arm of a shirt or something. You don't need to have your singer sewing machine, but but you still had to come pretty close to matching their size. Some they would actually send out the wedding garments to the invitees. Uh, I think in Jesus' day, the Jews, uh, the rich, rich people, uh, they, would, they would issue the wedding garments as people arrived for the wedding. But the point was, is that everybody, no matter what your social station was, is everybody was wearing this same kind of robe. Everybody looked essentially the same. That make sense? In other words, instead of the wedding party all dressing alike, which... I don't know if they even had wedding parties, but but they would. But the people that are coming to the big the festivities, uh, the the uh, what do you call it the reception afterward kind of thing, is they were all wearing exactly the same, essentially the same thing. And usually it was very light colored or even white. Now, uh, I want to look up a verse, and I'm having a vapor lock in my mind right now. Did I put it in here? Turn, uh, if, you, if you will, turn back to Isaiah 65. I think it's 65. Isaiah 65.
Uh, make that 64. 64. And we'll pick it up in verse 4. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by ear, neither has the eye seen a God besides you who acts for the one who waits for him. You meet him who rejoices in doing righteousness, those who remember you in your ways. Indeed, you were angry because we had sinned. In our sins, we remained a long time. And shall we be saved? Now listen carefully. But we all are as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness as, is as filthy rags, and we all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Let me look at one other verse here. There's, there's, a, there's, there's another, another verse in Isaiah that, that we won't go to right now. Uh, but what, what, what's being alluded to here is that our righteousness, the clothes that we wear, are as filthy rags before the Lord. And this king is representing God the Father. And he, we have, these, these people have come to his, the wedding feast of his son. Now, if Jesus is represented by the son, who is the bride? Church, right? The church, Christians, and so, so and, and and we've we've read before. You've read before the verses in in, in Revelation about that the, the saints will be clothed in robes of white, robes of righteousness in white, haven't you? And so, so here we are all at this wedding, and this one man is dressed in filthy rags, and then it says, as you as we read there at the end, is that. It was like we were, co we were, he was covered with like a fig leaf, with a leaf, and then we blew away. Nothing. He's standing naked before the Lord. Sounds like the verse in Hebrews, doesn't it? That we must all stand before the Lord. We must deal with him. We all stand naked before him with whom we have to do. We've got, that he sees everything there is about us. And so we need those people who attended this wedding needed to receive when the wedding garment was offered, they needed to receive it. Okay, everybody? In other words, don't think California weddings. Don't think American weddings. Think these uh, near oriental weddings. And so, what I want to do here is talk about his clothes, your clothes, my clothes. Do you have your wedding garment? What is your wedding garment? Let me tell you what is going on. He, this guy's wearing his own clothes. Nobody else is. He's conspicuous. He's a pretender. He's, got, he's gotten there. Uh, so for some reason, he's not being cooperative. He thinks what he's got is better than, or he's not, he's, he's keeping himself separate. And that is not what the king wants. He says, and it says, one of the writers says that instead, the beautiful, well, this, these are my words, instead of the beautiful, clean, new, valuable, free robe provided by the king, he's rejected this. Now, uh, one of the, some of the commentators have said this is like the highest possible insult that he could go to the wedding and insult the king, that he would not accept what the king has done because the king has paid a lot of bucks to have all these garments made. And they were put together with a lot of artistry and effort. And they're decorative. And it's a, something that the people can wear often. Like when they go to visit the new couple in their new home, it would be something that they might wear then. When they go to see this family from now on, they might wear the, you know, the whole family might dress up and go all in the same outfit when they go to, in memory of the wedding and the fun that they'd had. Um, and this is not just an insult 
It's worthy of punishment. It's worthy of kicking him out of the wedding like right now. And of course, we already read, that's what happened, isn't it? Um, re recall the filthy rags. And this, what this does is this really, in a marvelous way, represents the hypocrite in the church. The person who attends church because his mother-in-law wants him to or, or he's got business connections or you, you can fill in whatever, whatever reason that somebody would to, the, to go to church uh, on Sundays perhaps or maybe even be very active in church but not having the real relationship with the Lord now. This garment of salvation that is very intricate, that's, we know that Revelation 1 5, having been what? Washed, Jesus washed us in his own blood. That this, this, is, this, is, this robe of righteousness is precious to the Father, and the Son went to a great deal of trouble to make sure that it was, it was, it was available for us. It's dyed in his blood. But the hypocrite chooses the filthy rags of his own righteousness. And so he offers the highest contempt for the gospel. These, are, these words are from Barnes. Some of you may remember I've, I've quoted him before. And he is, he is to blame not for being invited, not for, not for being invited, not for coming. Because he is freely invited, but for offering the highest contempt to the king of Zion that is the Lord, in presenting himself in all of his filth and rags. In other words, I want to come based on who I am and what I have done. What do we call that, folks? Was that? Self-righteousness? I would, I, I would say yes. I would also say works-based righteousness. Is righteousness that's achieved by something I do. Remember what I've emphasized for 23 years here, right? Is that we're, we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, by Christ alone, right? According to God's word alone, for God's glory alone. That's straight out of Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, isn't it? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of works. Lest any man should boast. Because nobody gets to brag. Nobody gets to stand here and say, well, you guys, Jesus paid for all your sins, but he only paid for half of my sins because I worked the rest off. Oh, my goodness. What an insult to the Father. You see that this parable, Jesus is punching them right in the nose because the Pharisees are big on works-based righteousness. They are not repentant for anything. <clears throat> They'd rather go to hell than admit they're wrong. Have you ever known somebody that knew they were wrong and still wouldn't admit it? I have. I might have been that guy a couple of times. I, I hope not, but I, I, I think I've always thought of myself and tried to even, forgive me for saying it, prided myself on being a truth seeker and being willing to change. I'm going to stand here before you today to tell you that my theology today is different and far better than it was when I first got here. It's understanding that without perceiving the glory and the majesty holiness of God how can we really worship him if, if we don't understand that if we don't understand this sovereign God who doesn't need us he is not dependent on anything or anybody when somebody says why does God love me it's not because of what I have done or who I am or who I'm related to when somebody says why does God love me the answer is because he's God and he takes he, he loves the unlovable. Now, don't raise your hand. I'll just do it for you. Because this is the honest to God's truth for me. Is I grew up with some mama issues. Mom and dad were divorced when I was a little kid. My mom had, 
had become pregnant with somebody else's baby before they married, and she had to give, give the kid away. I never met, met him. I don't think he's even living today. But I now, about 10 or 15 years ago, I finally learned why my mom and I never really bonded. And I didn't even know, I didn't know about that concept until about, about 15 years ago. My mom had, had passed away before then. But when your mama really doesn't bond with you, you get the impression. Now you can, you've can you got to talk to the shrinkopotamuses to, to, to find this out. But when you don't think your mama loves you, you ever heard the saying, he's got a face that only a mother could love, and then only on payday? It's, it's when you don't feel like and you may not have this specific, if you don't feel like your mom really loves you, most of us here we grew up with, we knew that our mom would take a bullet, step in front of a bus, she would give us the last piece of cake when she was starving, she would do anything to make sure we were, her children were taken care of. Some of us didn't have a mom like that. And for, for the most people to understand about when a kid's mama doesn't love them very much, it's one of six or eight ways to get to the point where you're, you're ready. This is the punchline: is you don't think you're lovable, and that's that is my Achilles' heel, if you will. I believe is in my relationship with the Lord. Is I know God is good, and I know that He's a loving God, and I know that He went to a whole lot of trouble to make heaven available to us, but I just. I'm not lovable. I can think of a lot of reasons why I'm not lovable. Like who I am and how, what a doofus I am and a knucklehead and, and uh, uh, ADD, ADHD, all you want. Whatever. whatever. But uh, the, my heart goes out to you if you don't, if you have sensing or doubts that you're lovable, listen to me, brother. Listen to me, sister doesn't matter whether you're lovable or not. It's because of who he is. He is God and he gets glory for saving people, reaching out to the uttermost and bringing them to himself. Everybody, you ever notice it's really easy to love somebody that's lovable? But God loves the unlovely. He, he goes out of his way. We could go, uh, there's not enough time today for me to go into all these scriptures that I wrote down. That, that where he doesn't go for the, the rich or the powerful or the proud, he goes for the humble. He even says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, you might want to go there sometime. He says, he tells the people of Israel through Moses, I didn't choose you because you're great. I choose you because you're a bunch of knuckleheads and you're small and you're, you're losers. That's how God gets the glory. That's how he gets the glory. Because if he saves somebody that's lovable, if he saves somebody that's you know, the great athlete, I've told you this story before, haven't I? About this youth leader comes back and he's asking everybody, who was the, who was the person from the youth or from the retreat that we went to? Uh, who who was, gave the best talk? And uh, after a bunch of them said, well, this football player, this basketball player, this celebrity, this whatever, this preacher, this celebrity preacher, one of them said, name somebody's name. And, what? I don't remember that person. Oh, yeah, he was the guy that said such and such. I remember somebody said that. So, yeah, he's the guy that they brought him down in a wheelchair and lifted him up on the stage and gave him the mic for about two minutes. Folks, if that's, if God lifts up that person, what can he do for you? What can he do for me? Is and him when he does that, we put on his wedding garments. We don't put on ours. We throw our stuff away. We burn it. When, like Peter, remember Peter? What are you doing? You're gonna wash my feet. You're not gonna wash my feet. If I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me, Peter. Peter says, well, wash all of me. That's the kind of attitude that the Lord's looking for. It's 
So, the wedding garment, listen to me, the wedding garment, it is the righteousness of God in Christ. From 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, the, the verse we started out with. You got that? All right, now that's a big deal. You remember that for the rest of your life. Never forget that verse. It's like a top ten. You've got to know it. This is one of those verses that you need when the night is dark and you're down to your last whatever. You need that verse. You need to know God's Word. So, let me tell you about what the wedding garment is not. Now, this is the part where I hurt your feelings and I make you mad. You ready? Okay. The wedding garment is not good works. So far, so good. Right? The wedding garment is not our Christian behavior. The wedding garment is not living a holy life. The wedding garment is not any particular grace of the Spirit. Through the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, right? That's not what it is. The wedding garment is not even faith. The wedding garment is not charity. The wedding garment is not humility. The wedding garment is not repentance. I ran out of space. The wedding garment is nothing else. The wedding garment is not the whole work of sanctification. The wedding garment is not even from the Holy Spirit. It is the righteousness of Christ. It's His righteousness. Not of works, righteous works that we have done, Titus, uh, Paul says in Titus. He saved us with all of His marvelous glory and wonder and power and sweetness and benevolence. It's all about him and none about you and me. Now, once you're saved, uh, he wants you to trust him and obey him, doesn't he? But listen to me. Is if anything you did made you to become a Christian as opposed to him and him alone, then what that implies is, is that you can take it back. Which means the God that you worship makes mistakes and he can change his mind and throw you back in. Or, if you grew up in a denomination, or in a church, or in a family, or you paid any attention to what passes for religion on TV, is you can... Deconstruct your faith is what we call it today. Listen to me. If you think that Jonah was going to get away from God, you think that Jonah was ever going to get away from God? God sent a fish to the bottom of the ocean and put him in his belly, seaweed wrapped around his head, Jonah says, I kind of turned to wherever I thought the temple was, and I said, okay, Lord, I'm ready to do things your way. Okay, so if you grew up in, with the idea that, that you could somehow mess up and lose your salvation, or that you could mess up, now I'm not talking about... Uh, Let's say Elise thinks I'm a wonderful Christian and I put on the act for 20 years. And at some point I run away with uh, some floozy and, and renounce God and all that, right? And break my wife's heart and make, confuse my kids and just on and on and on. And Elise, what she sees, it looks like I've lost my salvation, right? But what was it really? Is I put on for 20 years. I faked it for 20 years. Or I was confused for 20 years. But at some, at some point, some point, the hog returned to her wallet. Right? And the dog to his mom. And so, I'm not saying that, that somebody might renounce their faith 
in front of you and you and what you're hearing is they walk away from God. That that does happen. But what I'm telling you is they didn't fool God ever for a moment. A moment. God sent that fish to go get Jonah. He sent the worm to eat that vine. God goes to a lot of trouble to save you. You put on his robes of righteousness. Uh, let's go back to this man. Verse, let's see. Verse 12. 20, uh, Matthew 22, verse 12. He said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without wedding garments? And he was speechless. He had nothing that he could say. Nothing that he could say. Listen to me. On judgment day, when we all stand before the Lord, we're going to have nothing to say. There's, there's just nothing. Is the question is, am I wearing the robes of righteousness? If he says, how did you get in here? I, I should have had uh, Nancy tube, tube up this marvelous video. Uh, I'll send it out on the next email. But uh, if, some, if uh, the, there's an angel and saying, why should we let you into heaven? Is Alistair Begg said, that the thief on the cross, he didn't know anything about church discipline. He didn't know about salvation by grace through faith. He didn't know about the inerrancy of scripture. And finally, the, this angel supervisor angel says, well, on what basis do you come here today? And he says, the man on the middle cross said I could come. That's it. Is that Jesus said I could come? That is, I'm wearing the robes. This is Jesus' robe that He put on me. And so, in Romans chapter three, beginning in sixteen, you need to turn there. Destruction. And he's talking about people, you and me, before we were saved, maybe even after we're saved. Romans chapter 3, verse 16. Destruction and misery are in their ways. That's just, that's just who they are. Look at, look at the news today. Destruction and misery are in their way. It's Romans 3, 16. Verse 17. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped. Every mouth may be stopped. And all the world become guilty before God. Or that all the world can just realize and admit to God themselves and others that they're guilty. Whatever he says that they deserve, they deserve it. Verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified or made right in God's sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin, right? The school is the, the, the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, right? Is the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. When I say the law came by Moses, I mean the Lord gave it to Moses. Moses turned around and told the people. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. That is Jesus. Even, verse 22. Even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. Uh, and then for that man, what happens to him? He's bound 
and cast into outer darkness. Now, there's a puzzling last verse here. Jesus ends it up, summarizes it, and says, this ties the loose end on or ties the bow on it, it says, many are called, but few are chosen. Uh, he said that earlier in chapter 20. I think what he means is he's not talking about specifically this one man. I think he's talking about the whole parable. Is that the king went to the trouble of fighting everybody, didn't he? He invited everybody. And what happened? There were people who ignored him, rejected him, right? Punished his servants and all of that. And then finally, this one guy comes, and even he, after all this marvelous grace has been shown to him, is going to do it his way. So, you need to be invited. Everybody. You need to respond. You need to answer the invitation. But there's a condition, and that is you got to do it his way. His way. Not your way, not your grandpa's way, not your preacher's way, not Jack's way. You got to do it the Lord's way. On the day of judgment, many are going to claim to have done good deeds. But Jesus will turn them away because they will, have, they will not have dealt properly with the basic issue, issue of salvation. They will not be properly and spiritually to be received by the king at the celebration for the son. God is looking for repentance and faith. Primarily, not just good deeds. Not just good deeds. And so, go ahead, Stephen. I think I've cleared everything out. Uh, do you have your robes of righteousness today? Sorry about being such a crybaby today. Uh, uh, I, I, I was already thinking about ahead of time, do, do I go ahead and publicly talk about, you know, confess that I don't see myself as very lovable. <laughs> uh, what kind of Achilles heel do you have? What kind of weaknesses? What kind of besetting sins do you have? What kind of self-doubts? What, what are they? Listen to me. Take them, bring them to the cross. Yeah. Lay them down at Jesus' feet. Yeah. Always remember. Always remember. This is one of the most liberating things that happened to me. I was probably in my 30s when I figured this out. Well, God just kind of you know, kept my eyes open and I pried open my mouth and pushed it down my throat. And that is the only thing that I bring to my salvation equation is the sin that made it necessary. Because at some point, he said to me, just like he said to Lazarus, he said, Jackie, come forward. He says, Carol, come forward. Larry, come forward. Teresa, come forward. Fiona, come forward. Jerry, come forward. Steve, come forward. And, and, and what happens is there's life in that command, and there we are spiritually just dead. And, and he says, Jackie, and you go, you're up. A lot more complex after that, isn't it? <laughs> Sorting all this stuff out. Figuring out how we're going to pay the bills and keep our reputation and all those kind of things. Remember, because of what he's done for me, is I want to be like old Bartimaeus. I want to be like that, uh, what's it, the Gadarene demoniac. Like the guy from Gad that, lived, that was among the, living among the tombs and, and the, the demons got cast into the pigs and they went over the cliff people from the town came out and they see this crazy man. It says he's sitting at the feet of Jesus clothed in his right mind. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to get on the boat and leave with Jesus, but Jesus says, no, no, not yet. And so he says he went around telling everybody in all the ten cities on that side of the lake what Jesus had done for him. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. He's the first evangelist. Mm -hmm. Jesus hadn't even left the planet yet. He's already out telling people about I had, to, I had to adjust my sights a little bit on that one. That's, is, that who, is that who you want to be? That's who I want to be. I want to be like him. No, no, and I mean, I still want to be Jack, but I mean, I want to be in that kind of category. If you have anything that you'd like to pray about, 
me to pray for you. If you ready to, the, remember I was praying when we first started about what is that next step of obedience, that next step of faith that, that, that God is calling you to make? Listen to me. If you don't tell somebody quite often, it just peters out and dies. But if you tell somebody, I'm nominating me for you to tell. Uh, your idea, this, this, this burden, this, this honor that God has given you, it grows legs. It makes a difference in your life, and then God begins to use you to make a difference in others' lives. But if you just squelch it and go to lunch, could very well die before you get to the park tomorrow. Don't let that happen. Let's all stand. Without him I could do nothing. Without him I shouldn't fail. Without him I to tell someone, hey, please don't walk away. Please consider Jesus. Please hear me out. That's okay. But remember that nowhere in the Gospels ever did Jesus say pretty please. The Gospel ultimately is a command. Right? Repent and believe the good news. That's a command. And the Lord says what he means. He means what he says. And he gives every day as a gift. And I mean, and I'm not talking about just uh, that, that you're necessarily going to wind up in a crisis eternity if not right now. But the Bible does tell you it's the day. The day is the day. Now is the time. So never put things off. Is nobody who die who will die today wakes up this morning saying this is going to be my last day on planet Earth. They never do that. I forgot who it was, but I just read this. It was where. One, a man is telling his children, this morning I ate breakfast with you. He, he, he realized that, that was when he was going to die. And that rarely happens. I mean, he, he realized it later that morning. That this is it. He says, tonight I will dine with my Savior. Live like Jesus rose yesterday. I'm sorry, Jesus was crucified yesterday, rose this morning, he's coming back tomorrow. That's the way it is. Uh, well, Father, uh, you're great and good and kind and sweet. You're holy. You're all majestic. And Lord, uh, words, as we put in infinitely so after those words, would be far more accurate. But Lord, uh, we want to see your glory because we know that you tell us in Corinthians, Lord, that that's how we're changed, is by perceiving your glory from one stage of glory to another. So, Father, we ask you to give us that hunger for your word so we meet you in your word. We see you in the, the events of our day and, and the conversations. And that we, every step we walk, every conversation that we talk, may it be with our Lord Jesus right there imagined by our side, but actually within us, in the person of the Holy Spirit of God, on our way to eternity, mm. to spend it with you. Mm. Oh, Heavenly Father, may this be a sweet, sweet thought for all of us this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, a couple of announcements before we go.
Um, we have ministry council coming up uh, immediately following, give people time to clear out, do what they need to do, uh, go to the bathroom, come back. Uh, but also, some people have asked me uh, that uh, uh, people who gave have asked, asked me about when we had the gas pipe problem out here. Uh, but is, do we still need more to cover that? And the answer is yes. Is I think we're about to, I think it's nine thousand something, and it's about seven thousand something we're giving. So, so yes, if if anyone would like to give any more, uh, but I encourage you that it be more than you would have otherwise given because we're already in a new budget year. We need money for this year too. Uh, we did not end the year well as strong as we had hoped uh, in twenty twenty two. So, uh, if you've been thinking about giving, uh, don't pace yourself. Go ahead and give. <laughs> but uh, we'll give a full accounting at the ministry council and a body life meeting coming up. Um, let's see. That's the one thing. Second thing is, I hope to start a, uh, uh, a citizenship kind of Christian citizenship kind of class. And it's not telling anybody how to vote, it's how to witness for Jesus pertaining to things like po political issues. People, things that people call political issues. Folks, abortion is not political. Abortion is moral. And we could name several other things like that. But we need to be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies yeah. within us. Amen. Amen. And not to be enemies with anybody, but to introduce them to Jesus so that we all get the glory wearing that righteous, that wedding garment of righteousness of Christ. Brother Steve. Join with the family, would you? Make us one, Lord, make us one. Holy Spirit, make us one. Let your love flow so the world will know we are one in you. Greet each other in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you for being here today. Be about his business this week. God bless you, family. Thank you for being here. Eternal God, unchanging, mysterious and unknown. Your boundless love, unfailing, in grace and mercy shown. Bright seraphim in a Fight around your glorious throne.